Last name, that is, that is rare. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, this was conveniently scheduled at the same time that the Zeke training is also happening, so thank you for coming to me. Uh, and I suggest you basically rush to the training after this talk. <laughs> uh, so, um, yeah, I'm going to give you guys an update on what we've been doing in the Zeke project, um, sort of uh, what Zeke is about, because I uh, learned that um, not everybody here knows, and um, sort of give a little bit of a roadmap sort of sneak peek. So, hey, everyone, I'm Christian. Uh, I uh, wear several hats, but the ones that matter today is that I am the Zeek project lead, uh, so I, I get to sort of uh, influence the technical direction of the project. Uh, I am a uh, recovering academic, so prior to switching to industry, I spent about a decade doing academic research on network architecture, network monitoring, and so forth that very much um, involved Zeek all the time, uh, basically to answer questions about network traffic that came up from project to project. And I work at Corelight. Uh, our booth is out there. I suggest you swing by, uh, and I get to basically work on Zeek full-time uh, in that position. Okay, uh, so what is Zeek? Um, so I'm gonna, this is a fairly technical audience, so I'm going to sort of walk you through technically what it actually does, um, uh, and I hope this is uh, of interest to many of you. So Zeek is many things, and the first thing it is, is a DPI engine. So DPI, Deep Packet Inspection, so it's a system that basically grabs packet by packet of a network um, and parses into it. So the way this starts out, and I'm sort of going to build this up from, from the bottom here, um, is that Zeek gets his hand on packets either via live network tapping or from a recorded packet source. And pretty much everything in Zeek is uh, pluggable, so um, it ships by default with plugins for, you know, sort of the, the, the base technologies that most people need. And then as you need more sort of advanced things, there is a package ecosystem for our own uh, package manager that you can use to basically pull in more functionality as needed. So to get started, for example, you can use something like, you know, AF packet or, uh, or just like basic PCAP to get your hands on packets. Um, and then what Zeek does is... Uh, it parses into this um, sort of as deeply as it can with a sort of a library of, of analyzers that it has at its, uh, at its disposal. Um, so it ships with about 80 parsers by default, and you can basically install a whole bunch more as needed from our uh, package ecosystem. And these analyzers would basically do what, what you would uh, expect, sort of like, like parse into the data. But what then happens next is kind of interesting and is completely unique to Zeek as far as I'm aware. And the next thing that Zeek is, is a distributed event-based system. And that doesn't follow very obviously, but basically the way it works is that each of these analyzers, as they parse into the traffic, throw events. So these events are basically highly dependent on the protocol that you know is in uh, that Zeek encounters in traffic. So for uh, for TCP, it could be something like, oh, I established a handshake. For um, DNS, it could be like, hey, I just witnessed a transaction. This was the query, and this is the response. For HTTP, it could be something like, hey, here's an entity that's being transferred in response to the following query, um, and and so forth. Um, uh, by default, you have about sort of 500 of these events to sort of deal with um, and do something with. Um, and I'm going to show you a couple of quick examples of what that looks like. Um, so this is one of the most commonly used events in the system. It's uh, basically raised whenever uh, we see a connection being established. And I mean connection sort of loosely here in the sense of TCP or a UDP flow. It could also be called like a flow being established. Um, and you can see that an event consists of a name and then typed arguments. So in this case, it is just one argument that is a connection. We say a record that has a bunch of metadata about the connection that this event is about. So this is very minimal. There's just this one argument, but there are lots of others. And to give you sort of a, a richer example, this is what we flag um, every time there is a, a TLS or SSL, you know, hello in the in the handshake. Um, Zeek is old. Zeek has been around for a long time, which is why a lot of the TLS stuff is still called SSL, in case you're curious. And you can see that the data types get a lot richer here. There are many more arguments. So you get a lot of sort of detailed data about what is happening in, in the traffic. And so... 
The next thing then that Zeek is, and I think the way I showed you these events was sort of foreshadowing that, is a programming language. So Zeek is a scripting language that you code in in order to deal with these events that the system throws at you. Um, and so that then is done in a script interpreter that sort of sits on top of the event engine in this sort of procedural, strongly typed language that um, is unique but not totally foreign to you if you're used to, I don't know, coding in Python, Perl, and so forth. Um, and Zeek by default ships with a whole bunch of scripts, like the, the meat of the system is very much in the script layer. Um, there's a bunch of sort of frameworks there that basically give you functionality for uh, logging, for notices, for alerting, for how to, dealing, how to deal with um, file analysis, how to get telemetry out of the system, and so forth. This is the, the heart of all of this is in, in the script interpreter. And so here's a quick example. Uh, this is not a programming course, but I just want to sort of convey the flavor. And what you see here is that the, the first thing on top is basically a global variable. It's a set of addresses that I called conorgs for originators, which is sort of a, a term used in the Zeek ecosystem for the side that establishes a connection. And that part in the upper middle there is an event handler. It is a handler for this event that I described earlier when a connection gets established. And what it basically does is that every time a connection gets established, it takes the originator's IP address and puts it in that set, in the conorix set. And then at the bottom half there, there is an event that C uh, throws when it is done, when it is shutting down. And it's basically just printing out a message here and it's iterating over that set and printing out the IP addresses. And so this looks sort of as like you would expect. So if you go to your shell and you basically type in Zeek, read in the following PCAP and assume that I put that code that I just uh, showed you into awesome.zeek and you run that, then you basically get some output. Um, so it's basically fully sort of up to you how you deal with these events and what you do with them. And this is one example of them. The next thing that Zeek then is on top of all of this is a log writer. And that's sort of the essence of what Zeek does in the script layer by default if you just sort of download it, install it, and run it. And what it does is it uses its scripting engine to basically give you logs that capture the activity in the network sort of as seen via these events, but sort of in a derived, in a, in a distilled, in a more meaningful way than these raw events. Um, and so we have a whole bunch of these. There are about sort of 60 logs by default. Uh, log types, um, and there's this most important one that we call the con log that is sort of, uh, f to make a bad analogy, sort of like NetFlow on steroids, where you basically get an entry for every connection seen on the wire with a bunch of metadata. So what were the endpoints? What were the volumes transferred? Uh, what was the sort of like history of, uh, for example, if it's TCP, sort of of the, the flags in that connection to give you an indication of how healthy the connection is, um, and so forth. Uh, and like I said, there's then a whole bunch of others, and these are mostly reflecting activity in specific protocols, like there is a log for DNS and there is a log for TLS and, and so forth. Um, and some are sort of more generic, like there is one that shows you how the analyzers in Zeek actually do their job and they confirm or, uh, or, or complain that uh, uh, a given flow is not matching a given protocol and so forth. There's a whole section just about file analysis, what types it sees on the wire and, and so forth. So there's a whole bunch. Um, and so that then basically sits on top of the script engine um, as one of the applications of it. And there, too, things are totally pluggable. So by default, you just sort of write logs to disk. You can do that sort of in a in a sort of like old school tap separated format that is still the default, but most people switch to JSON almost right away. Um, or you can basically use different plugins that do implement uh, that, that, that implement the writes differently, and then pump into Kafka or Elastic or um, Splunk or whatever you have. Um, to make this sort of end-to-end. -end. So basically, packets in, a bunch of stuff happens, logs come out. Um, so what I didn't show you in this earlier example is that this isn't the full story. So as we ran this PCAP, the other thing that happened in your local directory is that you got a whole bunch of these logs that basically abstract sort of the details from the PCAP, but convey to you what happened in the, in the traffic. Um, and uh, if you then sort of look at one of the examples in there, I think we also saw that in, in Benjamin's talk uh, on, on Tuesday, uh, this would be one record uh, from the conlog and uh, in, in JSON representation, and you sort of you know, get the gist of the, 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 the flavor in there. Okay. Um, I wanted to mention that uh, 
So, so those of you uh, who remember their computer science, there is sort of this well-known principle of uh, separating uh, policy and mechanism. Uh, so basically, you build part of your system to just sort of do one thing and do that well. And how you configure it all, how you plug it all together, that is sort of the policy side of things. And that is where you really sort of like, like dial in what you actually want the system to do. And, and so pretty much everything in Zeek is mechanism except for the script layer. Like it's really all configured there, even if it's a built-in thing that affects, you know, an analyzer or a log writer or one of those things. Um, right. And that then is a Zeek process. So if you just invoke Zeek on the command line, that is basically the thing that ends up running and, and what it does. Um, and in practice, if you want to day-to-day, uh, 24-7 -day, monitor a network, that is not really how you would use it. In practice, you run it as a distributed event-based system. So I said that earlier, right? Um, and if you notice what I just showed you, there wasn't a lot of distribution going in, in there. The distribution comes from running this thing as a cluster. So in practice, you run not one Zeek process, but many, and each process takes on a different role. Um, this is sort of maybe sounding... Uh, I don't know, maybe unexpected because everybody these days thinks like, oh, if you want to parallelize, you use threads and so forth. And Zeek is full of threads. They're just not used at the level that you would expect. And this, this dates back all the way to like the early days of Zeek when if you wanted to run Zeek on multiple cores, you couldn't run it on one machine. You basically had to buy multiple machines. Um, and, and that architecture sort of prevails until today. Uh, and in many cases, you can just run this on one machine, but basically you have that flexibility to say, if you want to scale up your cluster, just run more processes, and as needed, basically even distribute them among you know multiple machines, you can do that. And the way this works is, like I said, so the different processes have different purposes, um, and we basically join them up together, we hook them together via a publish-subscribe system. So these events and, and messages that the system needs to exchange then basically go over the wire, um, and, and, and you sort of have a cluster that is jointly doing this distributed event-based sort of processing. This is currently implemented with a PubSub middleware that we built in-house. This is also old. This is a little bit over a decade old. Um, and I'll talk about this a little bit more um, sort of toward the end of the talk. Um, but that was sort of a... Uh, uh, that is perhaps an unusual decision from today's perspective. And back then was pretty much the only thing that we could do because there weren't any other options yet. Um, a cool thing that I wanted to mention is that this is also uh, where you can basically open up the Zeek cluster to sort of external stuff that you might be interested in running. So we have we have bindings for this middleware that you can use from uh, Go, from Python, that you can use via WebSockets, and that you can basically use to hook up this eventing that is happening in the system to other endpoints, like you can run a little Python server if you want to do something else with these events. So the whole thing at that point becomes more of a more of a toolkit rather than the sort of like one specific thing that you use Zeek to sort of solve. It's a lot more flexible than that. But so basically, take away from this, like in practice, you run this as a cluster. The way you scale it is by basically like building out sort of a cluster that has more worker nodes. These workers are one type of this uh, sort of uh, architecture, and they basically do sort of the, they're the workhorses that actually do the, the packet processing, as I showed you in the, in the previous slide. Okay. So what is Zeek? So um, maybe you get the gist of it at this point, sort of. So it's a little bit like um, running Wireshark longitudinally. It's a little bit like um, eBPF for your network, you know, like, like just how you shove stuff in the kernel to run some eBPF code. You can basically react to events that are happening in your network, right, like in the scripting layer. But if there's sort of one analogy that I want you guys to take away from this talk, then it's this. It's a network flight recorder. So basically, you run Zeek on traffic, and what you get out is logs that will present to you what happened on the network when you travel back in time to look at these logs. And that then is also one of the most common UK use cases for Zeek. It is that somebody already has some infrastructure in the network that say something bad happened here, or like you got infected, or whatever you have. And then you wonder, well, gee, what, what, what happened in the last two weeks in the corner of that network? And then you go to that data, and it'll tell you. So that's sort of the, the, the most important take on this. Um, there is more. And so one of the benefits of speaking late in a conference is that you can sort of watch stuff for the most of the, the conference. And so these are all use cases that I saw mentioned in talks here and in conversations at Hack.lu this week, um, where Zeek would be ideal 
to solve, I think, sort of the questions that came up. And I don't have to dig into them too much, but, but so like one really common use case was that I just need to know what happened on the network. And, and people can use, you know, PCAPs for that. Of course, that is not a bad idea, but it's voluminous. It's rich. It's, it, it has perhaps too much information. It might be more effective to actually look at the logs instead of the raw PCAPs. Uh, one use case was to spot unexpected protocols. And that is actually one of the most common applications for Zeek. It's like, you know, that your server over there is supposed to be running, you know, whatever, uh, uh, um, your, your homebrew protocol, your TLS or whatever, uh, but it suddenly ends up not being encrypted. Like, wow, you might want to take a closer look at that. Um, several people I've had conversations with just about doing behavioral detections. So like, uh, sort of a, uh, uh, sort of a, a sequence of events that needs to unfold, uh, as you watch some malware sort of, uh, take hold. For example, there is a particular kind of DNS request that is then followed by a, um, a given protocol that does a certain thing. And it's events, like I said it in there already. So it's it's, it's much more meaningful to do this at the event layer uh, as opposed to, let's say, um, I think signatures, because signatures are sort of uh, usually built with this assumption that there is perhaps something malicious here. Um, and that is sort of not necessarily the most, I think, effective. It's not bad, but it's uh, perhaps not the most effective way to go about this. I'm sort of going clockwise here. Uh, many people just wanted to parse novel network traffic. They wanted to build out parsers for this. And I don't know how many of you saw Benjamin's talk back on Tuesday, uh, but we, I think, have really good technology for building these parsers in a way that, you know, most people otherwise couldn't. The, the bottom left one there was also interesting. So a lot of analysts have these sort of workflows that they do with the data in their sim, where they go, um, yeah, okay, so I know the data coming in, and then here's the pattern I look for, and and then this is sort of my derived data, and then I work with that. With Zeek, you can sort of left shift that. You can basically codify that in your script so you get that data from the get-go, so you don't have to do that in your scene. It depends on your use case whether that is a good approach, but if you have that very common problem of having too much data to work with, then that is something you can look into. And that's sort of just a, a walk through. There were probably other things, um, but I wanted to call these out because I think that was pretty cool. It sort of had me excited about watching the talks here. Um, so that was Zeke. Um, I don't know how many of you just learned something, but um, I think that is important sort of as a, as a baseline. And I'm going to spend the next couple minutes on basically stuff that's been new in Zeek ever since um, 6.0. I don't know how many of you know our versioning scheme, but the .0 ones are our uh, long-term support releases. Um, and uh, the current one is 7.0. We still maintain 6.0 until 7.1 comes out. And you were talking sort of about the span of about a year here. So this is new stuff sort of over the past year. Um, and the biggie there to flag right away is JavaScript. So I don't know how many of you know ZeekScript, but I bet more people know JavaScript than ZeekScript. And the way this came about was that my colleague Arne had this incredibly cool observation that since IO sources are a pluggable thing in Zeek, and that you can interact with a JavaScript interpreter in libnode via a file descriptor, you can hook those things together. So he went off and did that, and it turns out to work beautifully. So that's been in Zeek since 6.0. And to give you an example of what this looks like, this is just the code that I showed you earlier, right? This, like, this, this collection of the client-side IP addresses that get dumped out at the end, and this is the equivalent in JavaScript. It's basically like line by line equivalent, it's just JavaScript. And so we, the way we do this is that we have this global object just called Zeek that we use to hook things up against. Um, and so basically the equivalent of a Zeek event handler in, in, in Zeek script is Zeek.on. And so you can see that it's basically doing the exact same thing here. It is grabbing the connection established event, gets a connection as an argument, and then adds that stuff to the set. And when it's done, it prints it out. And the only thing that's different when you do this on the command line is that you take awesome.zeek, you turn it into awesome.js, assuming you've implemented it in JavaScript, and when you run it, it looks the same. So this is pretty awesome. Um, and the uh, one of the first things I thought I wanted to mention this at this conference, one of the first things we built to test out this technology is an integration with MISP. Um, because it turns out that it's exactly those kinds of use cases where you basically have you know, an, 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 an HTTP API type interaction, those things are much more easily done in JavaScript than with the somewhat clunky technology that we had in Z beforehand to do that. It's still in there, but, but you should use it. <laughs> um, and so, so this is uh, a, a MISP integration 
communication with Intel, uh, sorry, with Zeek's Intel framework, which is basically our framework for reading in uh, thread Intel at runtime, matching it, and then doing something. And it basically sort of shoves that information back into MISP to basically report that something uh, was found. Um, if you're curious, you can pull this up there. You can install it via, uh, via our package manager. The way you do that is that first line up there. Um, and this is pretty cool. So I, uh, we envision that a bunch more integrations that are sort of much easier built at that level um, are going to happen in um, in JavaScript. Okay. Uh, Another biggie, spicy parser adoption. So again, Benjamin talked about this on Tuesday, but um, I'm going to recap this a little bit. So, so spicy is a parser generator that we have built uh, originally as an academic project. Still, like several of us have former uh, academic hats, um, and it's basically a domain-specific language that gives you a really nice way to write the syntax and semantics of structured data. Protocols are one type of structured data, so that works really well. Um, we've had this in Zeek or in the Zeek ecosystem sort of available for a while, and we've been sort of treading carefully because um, you kind of don't want to screw up your analyzers, right? Like this stuff has to work. Uh, and so at this point, uh, we have five in the in the main distribution that are using Spicy. You can sort of see on the right-hand side there how I sucked that out of the, 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 the sources, but that doesn't matter so much. So that's, you might, you might want to say like that's not that much, but in the package ecosystem, there are at least 30 more right now, and they're mostly um, industrial control system protocols. Um, uh, and if you wanted to learn more about those, check out the ones by sisa.gov. So uh, they built a bunch of them. There was a Zeek webinar the other day by folks from NTT in Japan. They also did this, and they're actually sort of describing their whole um, like testbed setup and how they got the traffic and so forth. And this is pretty cool. Um, and so this is very much ongoing work, and the focus there right now is basically on a couple of things. So like we're still learning how to use Spicy best ourselves. Uh, so we're doing a little bit of, uh, or actually I should say a bunch of performance optimization. This is one of Benjamin's uh, biggest projects right now. Um, and a really cool thing is that we've basically built side-by-side -side implementations uh, or a, a, another implementation in Spicy of our TLS parser that we can use side-by-side -side now with our current one and that are basically exactly feature equivalent. And so what that allows us to do is basically go in there and say like, okay, so maybe Spicy is a little slower here. Like why? And there's the exact thing that you can go after or it behaves a little differently, like why? And then you can go after that. So this is, this is quite cool. And that parser should land in Zeek very soon. Uh, so that would mean it comes out either in 7.1 or in 7.2. And then we'll, at least for some amount of time, provide ways to basically switch them and then basically toggle over over time. But um, I hope that, could, that that convinces you a little bit to maybe check out Spicy if you haven't yet done that. Um, but for um, any new parser going into Zeek, there's essentially always going to be a Spicy code base or a Spicy implementation just because we find that it's a much better way to build parsers, uh, more maintainable, safer, and so forth. All right, better performance. Uh, so this is also important. Uh, I, I do sell that as a feature, even though you could debate, is that a feature? But in Zeek, it absolutely is. Um, and there are sort of a couple uh, uh, of uh, sort of different angles to this. Um, so one that we wanted to mention is uh, the, a thing we call the Zeek Abstract Machine. Um, this is uh, sort of another uh, uh, in-house implementation of sort of something um, pretty uh, unique. And it's basically a, a built-in script compiler. So what that thing does is basically it takes the AST that Zeek generates from the script layers, from the from the scripts that get loaded at startup, and then basically at, at startup, up time compiles that into this sort of low level format so basically picture like instructions and 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 and, and operands and, and so forth um, and since that stuff is basically closer to the actual physical machine it can execute that faster um, and so if you are using Zeek the way to try that out is to basically just add dash o uppercase zam like as shown there in the upper right um, and you'll see that Zeek is faster it depends a lot on your actual workload if it's just um, uh, doing a little bit in the script layer, then accordingly you get sort of like a little speed up. If it's mostly in the script layer, you get a ton of speed up. Uh, and from the sort of limited data that we have so far, it's sort of on the order of about 10%. Uh, if you evaluate that locally in your systems, be careful because you have to factor out that startup overhead, right? That, that compilation happens at startup, so you have to factor that out because then the actual speed up happens sort of at runtime, sort of over the next whatever many hours or days you're running Z. Right, and the other one, and I'm going to be sort of 
pretty brief here, is just that um, we found lots and lots of opportunities to speed up Zeek uh, when we started looking. And this is all at the level of like basically avoiding unnecessary work, avoiding unnecessary polling, tuning timers, using better primitives in C++, and, like throwing out some code and so forth. And those things, depending on you know the corner of Zeek that you're looking at, can really pay off. So we had, we had one use case where we were actually running a, a really limited configuration of Zeek on traffic that was really heavy in, in TCP SINs. And and it was pretty much twice as fast. So that's that's super cool. Um, so in combination with that XAM stuff, I think like if you use a, a really old version of Zeek and now are upgrading to something newer, you should see some uh, really nice speed ups. So sort of the, the, the biggies that we've been busy with sort of over the last year, and now this is a little bit of a sneak peek sort of on, on what we're working on and hoping to release in the, in the near future. And there's a ton there, but I sort of picked out three biggies. Um, and the the, the one in the top left here is um, pluggable cluster backends. So this is, in a way, really low-level stuff that users might not care about so much, but bear with me. Um, so uh, I mentioned earlier that the way we're doing this right now is basically with this built, uh, in-house uh, developed um, message broker, and we're currently working to basically make that too pluggable so that you can basically match Zeek whatever sort of eventing infrastructure you might already be using in your deployments. Um, so two common ones that come up in that setting uh, these days are NatsIO and ZeroMQ, and we have prototypes for those. I was running my first cluster the other day with NatsIO, and that was actually pretty cool. And one thing that immediately strikes you when you have that is basically whatever backend you use there, you, you gain all the native tooling that exists in, in that technology. Like for NatsIO, you have a client, and you can see sort of the events going through there. Um, and it just opens up a lot of uh, sort of you know possibilities. Um, that should hopefully land in a very first version in 7.1 for those who want to sort of live on the bleeding edge. Nothing will change for now regarding the way a cluster works by default, but we think this is really exciting, especially perhaps for the power users who want to sort of really sort of like have these things under control. Um, we're building out a new storage framework. So this is a key val data store um, that is really useful to have for certain applications, for example, where you know that you would need, like classic database stuff, where you would need to store mem more in memory than you have memory, or where you want to persist data across restarts of the cluster, uh, where you want to spread data across the cluster via centralized storage, stuff like that. Um, and that existed to a e degree in Zeek at this point, but it was sort of in the wrong corner of the system, and it wasn't yet pluggable, and that always kind of bugs us because we want to basically uh, allow people to basically provide their own implementations if they want to do this somehow differently. Um, and so the, the the ones that we're tinkering with right now are Redis, Postgres, and SQLite um, because they each sort of solve different use cases. Um, and it's a little harder to predict when that will land, um, but probably I would assume by 8 so basically, like next summer, that should be there in some shape or form. And then the one on the right here is uh, a, a better cluster management. And that is also sort of a really deeply technical topic. But our default manager for the cluster today is basically one that's been around since the early days of Zeek. Um, and it sort of matches modern primitives relatively poorly. It basically assumes that there were machines that you logged into to like configure stuff and like, like rsync things and so forth. And that really just doesn't match anything that is even moderately service-oriented in sort of more modern infrastructures. And for a while now, we've been building out a framework that allows you to do that better. Uh, it's been taking a while, mainly because I've been quite distracted with other stuff, but I'm hoping to get back to that a little bit more. Um, and that should also allow us to simplify deploying in sort of typical environments that most people think of when you run stuff as a cluster, like on most systems in the Linux space these days, you want to use system control to bring up your, your, your code, not some sort of like ad hoc tool. Uh, there are Kubernetes environments environments where you need to think about sort of, okay, so what goes in a pod and so forth. So that's keeping us quite busy. Um, and that last bullet point there is basically sort of an outgrowth of this, which is that um, if you remember the diagram I showed you earlier, there was one type of cluster node that is a logger. Um, and that too is in a way a pretty historical concept because it assumed that it assumed that you want to sort of centralize the logging onto disk in sort of one place. But today, many times you don't have a disk and you basically just could uh, log the data like as it is produced like in the worker node say there's no need to basically like fan out the processing of packets in the workers centralize it in a logger and then fan it out again into something like Kafka that doesn't make sense so it's nice to be able to get rid of that so it's another sort of architectural corner uh, that keeps us quite busy and I think I'm 
pretty much out of time uh, getting Zeek. Um, you can do this in several ways. There are Docker images, there are binaries you can build from source. But if you've never used Zeek before, then try it in the browser. We have a site called try.zeek.org that basically gives you sort of what you would call a REPL for other languages, uh, where you can type in some scripts, run it on some PCAPs that are living on that server. Or if you have stuff to share, you can basically sort of like upload your PCAP and run Zeek on that. So it's really nice for, the, for trying out stuff. Uh, I didn't say that earlier, but all of this is BSD3 clause licensed, so you can basically do whatever you want with it, uh, which we're actually quite proud of. <laughs> and uh, so it should allow you to basically use it in any context that suits your environment. And that's all I had. These are the usual sort of sets of links. Uh, check us out. Check us out. Visit us on Slack, uh, 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 Discourse. We're here to help. And uh, thank you very much. Cool. Hey, Mark. Good, <laughs> good to see you. Thank you. Uh, nice talk. So I, I know Zeek is way more than a network-based intrusion detection, as you have said, but it also is that, right? So mm -hmm. you have lots of scripts that actually look for particular yeah. uh, weird stuff. So mm -hmm. I was wondering, um, is this now a bit more in the back end because you, you didn't even mention it? Or if not, how, how does it work with the community to, right. for people to keep participating to enrich continuously because there yeah. are always new attacks to be detected? Yeah. Can you say a few more words about that? Yeah, that's actually a really great observation. So, so we in the Zeek team spend most of our time building that system so that other folks can build detections and so forth with it. So, so we are not in the detection business. Like you will essentially never not an absolute statement, but very, very rarely see us uh, develop, say, a Zeek package that, that detects some recent CVE or some such. Um, but it is our job to make sure that the people who want to build such things have the right, you know, events and so forth, the right technology sort of at hand. Um, so, so the best recommendation I have if people want to find these things is go to, to go to our package manager and see what is there. Because if it is out there, it is most likely there. It is most likely not in our uh, Zeek tree uh, itself. So we basically focus on parsers, on infrastructure, and so forth. But the detections is not so much the bread and butter for us day to day. But that's a really good point. I didn't say that. Yeah. Thanks, Christian. Thank you, folks. Thanks very much.